Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Catalonia for our historical region series. I treated this region here and there in some comparative videos uh, and now I, I, I talk about the origins of, of Catalonia together with other uh, regions. Uh, in, in the Spanish mark I compared the Catalonian development uh, with one of uh, Lombardy in the high middle ages. So here we are and we will keep talking about Catalonian history uh, in, in other videos of course you can find everything in the uh, if anything medieval Spain uh, playlist but it will surely create a Catalonian one uh, as well. So we start really with, with essentials uh, as a very short introduction right I'm not um, ironic if not subtly when I when I title uh, these videos um, in such a way because uh, really right even if I talk for two hours in a row it, it's nothing compared to the general introduction to this period it's just an approximation if you want that's why we need the rest um, and obviously we start from late antiquity at least the migration era in the fifth century when um, different uh, Germanic uh, groups uh, such as the Visigoths, led by Atalf, installed themselves in the Tarraconensis. Right, so this Roman province had been essentially encompassing the Ebro Basin. We are in 410. We're exactly uh, in the same year of the of the sack of Rome by uh, the the Visigoths, and there is an initial settlement here. Then later on, the um, Visigothic king Euric formed the kingdom of Toulouse. We are in 475, incorporating uh, the territory equivalent to present-day uh, Catalonia. Right, the Visigoths, as you know, had been politically um, essentially a, a Roman creation in Illyricum. Right, they had uh, been substituted. Um, to the to the Roman army there, and they had there had been a consistent back and forth in terms of, especially the, the Western Eastern Roman Empire for getting rid of them. They had been defeated multiple times by Stilicho, but when this had been eventually assassinated by the Western Roman Emperor, Italy found itself without an adequate uh, command, and the Visigoths that were essentially claiming their um, their share of money for the quite bloody tribute they had paid to Rome, and after which, uh, after this, had actually taken revenge on their women and children, had remained settled, plundered Rome in a actually very uh, tidy way, right? Um, as they had their own share of, um, you know, terror slash. Uh, respect in as much as they knew that they would have been settled eventually allowed to settle in some other peripheral western parts of the empire and this nucleus had been in fact what we call Aquitaine even though it's mostly like the, the concept of Aquitaine is mostly from the Atlantic side um, of, of, of Gaul and the the um, the province we're discussing in the late in late antiquity is the Diocletian one that encompassed what had been previously the Narbonensis, right? Uh, so Toulouse, etc. That aimed mostly at, in fact, invading the uh, also southern territories, in which this other peoples, as we'll see now, together with the, with the Visigoths, had been settling in the Iberian Peninsula. Now, the Ebro Valley was one of the single most Romanized areas in the entire empire, and this would um, contribute uh, to define the character of today's uh, Catalonia, because uh, the Visigoths, at some point, as you know, are defeated at Bouillé uh, in Gaul by the, uh, by the, the Franks, that uh, stripped them of um, basically all the Gallic territories except for the small uh, land stripe um, that runs uh, along, in fact, the Narbonensis coast up to the Pyrenees, that is Septimania, that would remain known as Gothia, in fact, and that was very much uh, connected with uh, mostly the Ebro Valley. But this this part, and in fact, as we will see now, in the high Middle Ages, Catalonia would 
maintain up to Murea a, a quite intense you know interference even in southwestern French uh, affairs for for this reason and beyond not only there was also Provence etc um, but we're talking about again for late uh, antique standards quite civilized areas because they are deeply Romanized and they are distant from the more continental side of Spain which is the one instead uh, in which the Visigothic kingdom uh, installs itself from uh, in fact Toledo um, uh, uh, um, an Hispanic rule that lasted until the early 8th century when Islam took over the uh, Iberian Peninsula. Uh, as you understand, uh, so th th there are mountains in between, there is Aragon in between, there is again the Ebro Valley is, is from the, the Mediterranean watershed, so it's it's um it's another world a bit, and even though this, as we'll see, was overrun by the Muslims, by a degree kept uh, an important degree of autonomy that is a bit the deal of, you know, as you know, also for political, right, in historical, um, even in close historical times, but the, the deal of um, Catalonia. Uh, so the the Visigothic kingdom was also very Romanized, just like the Burgundian one. Uh, it respected and adopted the provincial system that uh, in this region had not been particularly shattered from Roman times. It had somehow contracted, uh, declined demographically, agriculturally. But um, just like Gaul, right, was still um, intact, largely. Um, uh, and the Tarraconensis, as this historical um, region, taking the name from Tarraco, on the essentially on the Mediterranean coast, some of the areas that Rome uh, seized the earliest um, in, in Hispania was uh, maintained as such. Um, however, administratively speaking, was defined to what contributed to define further um, the the current Catalonia was the establishment of the new province of Cantabria, which reduced the Tarraconensis continentally to the Ebro Valley and defined, therefore, better um, the, uh, you know, the, the current political uh, space of, of Catalonia. In 654, the Visigothic king, Rechesvint, ordered the promulgation of the Liber Judiciorum, also known as Visigothic Code, the Lex Visigothorum. So, the Book of the Judges, literally, which was the first law code that applied equally to the gods and to the Hispano-Roman population. Again, this is typical of the Visigoths and the Burgundians. They began to, to legislate in ways that were comparing juridically, um, equating, if not, in fact, as they could. But there is a huge debate in the history of, of law how basically the subjects were to to apply to, to a per, just a preferential law, right? And especially in these countries, again, not just the, um, you know, the the, the Hispano-Romans were the overwhelming majority of the population, but it was probably their lifestyle, their their intense level of humanity that contributed immediately uh, to the establishment of a, you know, uh, of a government would would legislate in Latin and would uh, wouldn't try to to create differences or to maintain differences between the population that in fact all over Europe pretty much uh, wouldn't really uh, if they ever existed in terms of a broader you know positive political application they disappeared in just the first couple of, of generations uh, at at the latest in any case um, the here, don't get me wrong, whoever could, again, uh, um, say, I want to be judged as a Roman, I want to be judged as a German, meaning that the laws, the two different laws, existed at the same time. However, this is the point exactly with these specific countries, that they went the closest to just immediately, just legislating something that was already mixing the two things to to a practically indistinguishable degree. Um, this compilation of the Liber would be in vigor in the Catalan counties until 
the um, the usages of Barcelona that were the customs that would go on forming the basis for the Catalan constitutions compiled in the 11th century by the Count uh, Ramon Berenguer I and uh, widened uh, later uh, and that was already based in fact on the Liber Judiciorum right so again um, significant Romano-Germanic legacy and especially a, a Roman one in this specific area now th this is important on the longer run because you know that Castilla would uh, it's, it's difficult to just trace the you know that that um, long of a, of a thread but uh, the say continental Spain would mostly develop some sort of you know feudal profile compared to 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 Catalonia mostly that had a much more evenly spread uh, amount of, of wealth right and this in part stemmed from the the more civil equilibrium that had remained in in the Ebro Valley um, a bit just in the because of the previous distribution of wealth but also because the Latifundia system had um, probably being weaker already in the era, whereas the Visigoths normally capitalize upon them, and still to the point that they would substantially choke the government of, of Toledo that was paralyzed in front of the Muslims, etc. So the Ebro Valley was a bit more dynamic, and just even closer to uh, other um, southern European areas like uh, Occitania, mostly so Provence, but also uh, northern Italy, and generally speaking, this kind of world of substantial, um, you know, you can say necessarily urban power per se, Barcelona eventually would grow as the, the major, most important center, but still, right, there were important centers that could uh, express uh, to a significant degree that uh, sense of ancient uh, uh, tradition of Romanity. Uh, of kind of uh, less feudal rule. This different character showed up on different occasions, such as between 672-673, where the eastern part of the Terraconensis, so properly the, you know, the more or less the modern-day lands of Catalonia, and the province of Septimania rebelled against the Visigothic king Vamba. Um, and appointed uh, as a uh, king in uh, Narbonne, in southern France, the Dux Flavius Paulus, right, who was a Roman general in, in the service of the Visigothic kingdom. We'll never talk about this in a dedicated video, but it's notorious that, especially in these areas, but even further north, um, some Roman units kept uh, not just standing but also were integrated um, because of their military standards in, in the in the Germanic armies um, and again these lands had mostly remained very Roman uh, in, in character right Vamba succeeded however in crushing this rebellion Again, we cannot digress on every single detail here, but it, it's important here to, to, to point out the general autonomy that this area enjoyed, right, in the Visigothic Kingdom, right? Well, it wasn't one of necessarily, say, the, the greatest problems derived from controlling the northern frontier. It was much more complicated just even to to stamp, like if raids uh, were sent from there, etc. So basically... As you know, the northerners did what they would keep doing in uh, with the with the Muslims and uh, and so on. It had been tough to 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 crush those areas, even in, uh, with the the full power of the early imperial uh, Roman legions. The Abravalle and Septimania were is that as we see more civilized, but in this sense, were not really a less important place to kind of uh, make political pressures to to autonomize themselves from Toledo, right? Especially when uh, the um, Visigothic power was turning towards an ever more private 
kind of um, direction, right? And um, with much greater difficulties also to, to keep things together, centralized. The, the Toledo Kings uh, at a point had barely a control of over a 30 miles radius from 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 the capital where and with all around the nobility basically keeping them in check through the famous councils and I made a video about that but we'll keep talking about the Visigoths however this fragility was definitely showed for also many other reasons uh, in 714 when the um, Umayyad forces conquered Spain reaching the northeastern part of the Iberian Peninsula and where some important clashes took place because of the local resistance that showed, in fact, the, the function is a, a, a local autonomous uh, government and uh, armed forces. Um, we know of Zaragoza in Aragon and possibly also in Barcelona. In any case, um, the Muslims um, took over this uh, land. In 720, Narbonne fell to the joint Arab Berber forces, but in which there were surely lots of also of uh, Christian uh, Iberians, to which followed the conquest of Septimania, the last uh, kind of uh, independent uh, stripe of what had been the kind of Visigothic uh, kingdom, broadly meant. Um, in fact, the last king. Um, the Visigothic kings of Hispania died in battle in 721 and Nîmes was captured four years later right? and this, this stripe again stretching from the Terraconensis up to Provence was quite compact um, uh, in say a natural sense right? shared much um, on itself uh, and um, it, you can even breathe it in, in those places, right? If you visit southern France, you, you feel that air of Spain and this Romano-Germanic Visigothic legacy uh, stretching right from great part of, of Occitania, especially, of course, the Western, the Western one. Um, I made a video about the county of Toulouse, etc., so you can check partly these things out. Um, in the 8th century, such movements uh, triggered, however, the intervention of the Franks, that, uh, especially after the Battle of Tours in 732, took advantage of the uh, Aquitanians by seizing their power that had been fundamentally crushed by the by the Muslims to, um, you know, in fact, to, to take control of an enormous area of southern Gaul that had never quite being nationally agreeing with them, but, but then now was prostrated. And uh, as a consequence, they found themselves um, extending their southwestern frontier to uh, exactly the uh, the Pyrenees and, uh, say, controlling uh, the corridors that brought from Spain to Gaul that the, the, the Moors used to launch substantial raids um, into Gaul itself. Like the Battle of Tours surely prevented Aquitaine to be consolidated by the Arabs, or at least, say, the, the, the maintenance of a substantial foothold in southwestern um, Gaul. But after Tours, the, the Moors kept launching uh, raids in, in southern Gaul, uh, reaching as far as Provence without uh, much that the Franks could do for a while. Right, if anything, because they were, had their own internal political issues, fragmentations, etc. However, the expanding Frankish Empire, especially under Charlemagne and Louis de Pius, set about creating um, a buffer zone of Christian counties um, in the south of the Pyrenees. So, with this uh, in this area, uh, say in part uh, also just north as we will see now with uh, Roussillon, including the Val d'Espire, right, following the conquest of Narbonne in 759, that would become historiographically known as the Marca Hispanica, the Spanish mark, or Gothia, right, because those were the places that, from the Frankish point of view, were still um, Visigothic uh, in nature. 
uh, and it really were, right, identically, juridically, uh, and so on. In 785, the county of Girona, w together with um, uh, the town of Besalu, on the south side uh, of the Pyrenees, was captured by the Franks. Ribagorsa and Pallars were at this point linked to Toulouse, that uh, was the, the most important um, Frankish avant-post uh, in, in, in southwestern Gaul, right, the most important city, and as we've seen, what had been uh, already uh, seized by the Franks back in Merovingian times, but uh, the, the power over which was revived now on the Carolingians. Um, and these territories were added to the um, to this county, um, the county of Girona, uh, around 790. Uh, the Urgell and Cerdania, uh, so these comarcas as were called, were added to the county in 798. Then we have, so it's a collection, right? It began like the gradual um, seizure by the Carolingians of these various provinces. Also, in, in the mountains, with a very interesting warfare that would remain characteristic also uh, of the areas that uh, always enjoyed a substantial autonomy. Um, up, up to the most important cities on the coast. Right, for example, the first records of the county of Empurias, right, on the Mediterranean coast, together with um, the village of Peralada, are from 812. Um, the county was probably under Frankish control for like a dozen of years before. Uh, this was going on all with substantial struggles that entailed even a local resistance against the Franks, right? Not everybody there was awaiting, you know, the Carolingians to come liberating them because within uh, the, the Islamic uh, sphere they enjoyed a substantially decentralized uh, position, right, that uh, sometimes was better even than the one so distant from the, the center of Frankish, uh, say, of the Frankish heartland. Uh, and power, right? Uh, the Muslims themselves were defending these territories with the local support, but after a series of struggles, Charlemagne's son Louis de Pius managed to take Barcelona in 801 from the local Moorish emir and established what is, in fact, the county of Barcelona. I will make a video specifically about the county of Barcelona at some point. Today we talk about the, the historical region. Uh, all together, right? So, the the Marca Hispanica thus established was uh, ruled by um, uh, counts uh, with small outlying territories, uh, each ruled by a lesser uh, milas. So, or at that point, a heavily armored uh, horseman that was to dominate uh, warfare on the longer run together with armed retainers, so again, uh, uh, de facto feudal elite, uh, proto-feudal elite at this point, that owed allegiance through the Count uh, of uh, Barcelona to the Carolingian Emperor, right, and later to the kings of West Francia, because Catalonia would be part, henceforth up to the, um, the 13th century, of the Western Frankish Kingdom, officially. I've, I've made a video about southwestern France that shows how there were also substantial contacts, right? Actually, this area is preferred at the point to interact with the Western Frankish kings more than other parts of southern Gaul, because... Um, they were so decentralized that they had nothing but to gain um, in that specific context. So at the end of the 9th century, uh, this was evident because Carolingian power was somehow collapsing, at least in a territorial uh, sense, um, over this enormous Western Frankish chunk that had outlined itself, and was uh, the, the monarch of which, Charles the Bald, um, uh, understood um, by starting to 
designate some you know local rulers that could be just co-opted from 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 the local nobility and support hopefully su keeping to support from the distance the, the royal authority um for um uh, catalonia uh, uh, it was uh, wilfred right called the hairy the count of urgell Cerdania, barcelona girona besalu and ausona uh, a noble descendant of a f of a family from um the historical Catalan comarca of Conflent and son of the earlier count of Barcelona, Sunifred um, the first uh, to be invested as um, on that occasion properly as count of Sertania and Urgell, maintaining a, a substantial power over the, um, the uh, essentially controlling the most important passes right, and areas think about the uh, also, for example, the local episcopal see the Seu d'Urgell, um, that uh, maintain the crossings in the in the hottest uh, areas, let's say, of of the of the Pyrenees, right? In in this sense, the the strategic value of these um, counties, um, such as Urgell and Sardinia, lay in the in the capacity to keep interfering properly into the Spanish. Interland, uh, as we've seen also in the video about the Duchy of, of Gasconia, uh, even more than the coast was concerned, because the coast, in a way, was was to remain autonomous on its own. They would always have their own cities, so there the political, uh, also the strategic mechanism worked differently. But controlling the passes was really crucial, right? For even just showing which, um, which empire was the strongest and. Uh, who had the upper hand, right? Just even internationally on uh, on this frontier area, right? Um, when uh, Charles the Bold died in eight hundred seventy seven, Wilfred became also Count of Barcelona and Girona. We are essentially the following year, uh, and he brought together a great part of what would become the uh, the, the modern Catalonia. At the death of Wilfred, the various counties uh, were divided again among his sons, which was again a normal practice, even juridically, but just reflected also the uh, the the substantial autonomy that the, the counties had even um, from from each other. Right, they were after all mm, tiny, compact, but uh, strategically heavy provinces that couldn't quite be forced to obey without uh, extremely ex expansive wars and so on. So much of what would keep them together politically was the um, the preservation of their autonomies and the uh, the, the current threat right from, of military expeditions from the emirs uh, from whoever was threatening their their positions um how and however since uh Bill, um Wilfred's death the counties of Barcelona, Girona and um Ausona would remain uh under the same person right creating the core of the future principality of Catalonia um, and part of the reason is again the most uh, the more kind of uh, this word the most coastal areas Ozona admit uh, Ozona admittedly not but it was substantially in flatter lands um, and um, Girona and Barcelona basically were the uh, the last um, uh, admittedly it was Tarragona as well um, in further south before the you know the territory ruled by by the emirs um in emporius roussillon uh, in the north but these ones were the most powerful the ones that would become in fact the the center itself uh, especially barcelona of, of uh, catalonian power right and they understood that they were stronger just united and in, in this way they they wouldn't you know things with a single ruler things would work more smoothly 
right? As they were more open to again to to, uh, to threats from from sea, from flatlands, and so on. Um, and uh, the the when Wilfred uh, died in eight hundred ninety seven, he made um, the 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 titles of these possessions hereditaries, right? Founding the dynasty of the House of Barcelona would uninterruptedly rule Catalonia until 1410, uh, the year of death of Martin I, right, uh, king of uh, Aragon, Valencia, Sardinia, and Corsica, but count of Barcelona, and uh, it's up to the year before also king of Sicily, but we will see. Um, this this now. Um, what was occurring in, however, those parts of Catalonia uh, ruled by the Muslims, right? Here we are in the age of the Emirate, eventually Caliphate of Cordoba. I made a video some months ago um, about it. Um, Vu's power was in fact centered uh, in in the south. Thus, having substantial difficulties in ruling, uh, you know, directly, especially the northeastern frontier, that again kept maintaining this this autonomy. Whoever was ruling there, really, and gradually developing its own local um, institutions. However, um, the uh, Islamic culture was um, was strong in these areas uh, as well, because as we've seen, uh, a substantial amount of the uh, the Christian inhabitants of these Muslim border regions did convert to Islam, right, as it had happened in, in the south, uh, in this um, especially Mediterranean coastland, there were, there were lots of Jews as well that in Spain really made up um, tens of percentage of the entire population. We've seen the, the Mudayars in other videos, uh, we've seen uh, the this in the one also of the kingdom of Valencia, right? So most of these populations did side with with the conquerors, and you cannot rule anything if this doesn't happen. Uh, in any case, and would take in fact centuries before the tides were uh, would be reversed, right? Um, Vu ruled from, from the border areas, mostly cared also about stabilizing the, um, the border against the Frankish ruled but very autonomous uh, Christian counties along this um, line constituted by the Lo Brigat and, and Cardener rivers as well as the uh, Montsec range uh, in the pre-Pyrenees, right? So the most important cities here in Islamic control were Leda uh, and Tortosa, uh, an area that would be considered as the, the new Catalonia later on because it was in fact the one eventually stripped by the, by the, uh, from, from the Muslims. Uh, and these two centers especially constituted the the main defense of uh, Islamic Catalonia. Especially the inhabitants of the valleys of the Ebro, Zagre, and Sinca uh, rivers, as well as the ones of the plain of Leda, took over the way of life and achievements of, of Islam, right? such as the highly developed irrigation techniques that the Arabs were legitimately obsessed with having come from from the desert but really um, capitalizing on as we've seen the substantially advanced areas in question so at least in terms of demographic and agricultural uh, availability and, and also remember always the the sea um, dimension that perhaps we will observe uh, more in detail in, in another video um, other important city in Islamic control was Balaguer. Right? Um, these centers developed 
uh, according to the, the Muslim pattern, an old town known as Medina, uh, in essentially North African style, with a mosque right here, uh, that was the citadel essentially with the administrative headquarters, the court of the local emirs. Uh, they also had large souk markets, uh, which uh, hosted the workshops, um, the also the, the the homes of of the artisans. Some areas uh, were open places of worship, right? The musalla, such as in, in the case of uh, Tortosa, right? They included. In this uh, area, also military fortress, we know that uh, goods were exported from the port of Tortosa, so showing that the interland was productive for other areas of Islamic Spain. Um, and even though uh, there were some peaceful moments uh, along this frontier. Generally speaking, the aggressivity of the northern marks that, as we have seen in the origins of, of um, really of Navarre, of Aragon, Catalonia, in another video, were very very much warlike, were made up by mountaineers, they had probably a different mindset, more warlike, more, more, more tribal by a degree, and kept pushing and pushing over the centuries. Um, with uh, Islamic reprisals that invaded these valleys, seized the, the cattle, destroyed the settlements, but the, the locals would take refuge up uh, in in the, in the mountains, in the forests, uh, etc. In, in 985, uh, Al Mansur, uh, the Islamic Arab Andalusi leader. Um, and ruler of the caliphate sacked the same Barcelona, the most important center, and um, thousands of its inhabitants were enslaved in the process. Right, so uh, alternating moments of kind of coexistence and ruthless violence. Uh, that, however, probably helped in this sense of you know, strengthening the local political and institutional structures that were, as you understand, uh, decentralized for, from both powers. Like, the Franks basically wouldn't uh, get there uh, anymore, right? Just the French would come uh, in the following centuries. The the Muslims gradually uh, would lose their grip uh, from, from northern Spain, and actually these, the, the Catalonians, started... Um, as we've seen in the video about the Parias, um, exacting large tributes on the southern, richer, more populated, more agricultural um, cities, uh, and expanding, conquering further territory. So a very gradual process, but that helped dimensioning quite quite interesting polities. Um, from the Christian side, during the 10th century, uh, the various Catalan uh, counties became increasingly uh, independent of the weakening Carolingians. Um, this was evident uh, even uh, at the rise uh, of um, of Hugh Capet in 887, when the following year the Count of Barcelona, Borrell II, decided to um, uh, decline to swear fealty to the newly elected Western Frankish uh, king. In, in that sense, they, they were, as we said before, actually more tolerant of the Capetians than other areas uh, of the of the kingdom. But in this case, Borel II was complaining against uh, the, the Western Frankish king for uh, not having received enough military help from the north against the Muslims that were launching substantial incursions in, in Catalonia at that point. Um, the social profile that the Catalan counties were taking on in 
during the 9th and the 10th century was peculiar and characterized by the estate of the aloers that were essentially um, uh, small medium farmers right essentially uh, living in family based uh, agricultural communities living of largely of subsistence as was the case at the time but that also um, had uh, albeit not uh, owing a uh, formal feudal allegiance a substantial um, militia say capacity right and altogether reflected a bit the you know again the, this growing um, sustratum of uh, freemen that again in areas where as we've seen there wasn't a dramatic surplus uh, most of the time still however maintained their own individual and say political uh, autonomy uh, in the 11th century however uh, things started accel tilting let's say towards uh, the feudal forms more slowly than in other uh, uh, areas of the western Frankish uh, kingdom right the milites began locally first of all to to just that were these more powerful individuals who became richer also at the expense of others and or that were delegated uh, it's a bit to phases of the same coin right uh, for kind of the military defense so having an ever more specialized kind of gear uh, being able to, to fight uh, on horseback and thus also um, being co-opted by the um, the more powerful leaders of, of the region through links of essentially uh, vassalage right uh, vassal uh, vassalatic beneficiary um, uh, agreements right that were definitely uh, reflecting at least the decline of the independent the previously independent peasantry um, as a matter of fact this process was violent Right, uh, the lordly force came to again um, strike the peasant communities that couldn't quite just put up a, an effective uh, resistance without developing on, on their own some form of local signary. Right, where the heavily armored and tendentially professional uh, horsemen now was becoming part even of just ever greater clientele so uh, collective training was increasing um so the dominance of of of, of cavalry on, on these battlefields that was profiling itself uh, at least this phenomenon was important because even though the alloyers declined uh, overall as an estate some of them started becoming um knights fundamentally um militas at least and um, uh, substantially fragmenting the power of the cows so these older uh, districts uh, began to uh, fragment politically speaking uh, and the physiognomy of the Spanish mark um, uh, evolved towards uh, even more numerous counties that would start getting fragmented for patrimonial reasons, for wars, uh, for again you know, inheritance um, uh, divisions, uh, and, and so on. Right, um, and this essentially changed the face of, of the land into a feudal country of some sort, based on complex fealties uh, and dependencies that did not correspond to the original uh, Carolingian. Um, uh, system that uh, um, up to that point had uh, undoubtedly also favored however an, an important development of, of these areas um, the marches as you know were um, were the frontier areas right they were militarily organized right? so the the emergence also of local militants etc reflected uh, uh, like the, the the character of a frontier area where the, the communities were habituated just to take matters in, in their own hands and now were essentially updating to the standards of western western warfare during the regency of the countess um, 
uh, consort of Barcelona, uh, Hermesint of Carcassonne, the disintegration of Catalonian central power was evident. It would be only under her grandson, Ramon Berenguer I, Count of Barcelona between 1035 and 1076, that um, the, in fact, the county of Barcelona would start uh, emerging as an overlord over the surrounding counties, thus hegemonizing not just the, uh, you know, the, the, the country, but also the political, uh, the international political uh, relation with uh, surrounding powers. Right? And, and in order to sanction this, um, this important uh, growth that required definitely also a degree of centralization, state building, um, Ramon Berenguer I initiated the uh, codification of Catalan law, writing down the aforementioned usages of Barcelona that were a very important um, compilation of feudal law for Western European standards at the time. It was aimed at collecting all the, again, previous uh, laws issued in the land. Um, as we've seen, it was based on the Romano-Germanic uh, code um, of, of the land, plus these um, feudal uh, norms that had just aut autonomously spread on the base of local customs and beyond. It was not easy, right? But um, it was particularly important because um, Catalonia now could emerge as um, a substantial polity had it managed to districate herself through this process of feudalization that could serve as a glue for a more centralizing um, policy. At the same time, uh, the church was increasing uh, in power, right? Uh, we are essentially in the years preceding the uh, Gregorian reforms, the papacy has um, uh, an ever greater um, international power, and it managed to discipline together with the local uh, bishops, uh, feudal violence, right, exactly helping uh, lay authority in this task of pacification that in fact took place through the so-called peace and truce of God. The peace of God, famously enough, I've, I think made videos on them, I explained them, uh, consisted in sort of immunities on, first of all, the church and more, more in general against those who could not defend themselves. Um, while the truce of God was essentially a temporary suspension of, you know, the the exercise of arms, say, uh, on the day of the Lord, or in other particular uh, Christian holidays, that were pushing towards the effort of disciplining uh, the local militas, making them kind of more functional to the um, collective effort of the uh, of the count. Of, of Barcelona, so all things that uh, uh, also directing them, of course, against the the Muslims during the uh, Reconquista, and surely these lands uh, did contribute importantly. They were also the ones from which most of the Western, say, the Frankish knights uh, arrived, right from um, from from Central Europe. Also, the ones from which the uh, Italian fleets were starting to uh, to support. Um, the Reconquista um, from Tortura Coastal um, pressure on the Muslims. Uh, so all this required the Catalonians to just extend even the range of, of interactions to try to compact um, local power gradually but uh, successfully in the end. Uh, the first assembly of peace and truce was presided by the abbot Oliba uh, in Toulouse, that is in today's uh, southern France, in Roussillon, in 1027. 
right? Um, so the w these initiatives were aimed, as we've seen, at promoting the establishment of so-called sagretas, right? So um, some sacred areas that would um, around the, the churches where people could not be um, could find asylum, right? Could not be uh, murdered, could not be um, struck down. In fact, under the penalty of excommunication from the local bishops and presenting um, the uh, the matter also to the higher uh, authorities of Christianity. So what is interesting is also how the name of Catalonia appeared. Right, the first documented evidence of such name is from an early 12th century um, Latin chronicle called the uh, Liber Maiolicinus, the Justice Pisanorum Illustribus, um, detailing the Pisan-led joint military expeditions of Italians, Catalans and Occitans against especially the type of the Balearic Islands, and in particular the, the one of, of Mallorca, uh, but which tells you a bit just the background uh, of, of all these uh, political events. And in this work, uh, Ramon Berenguer III, Count of Barcelona, uh, we say here Count of Barcelona because, as we've seen, Barcelona is gaining power, but formally he was, for example, Count of Girona, of Ausona, uh, Besalou, Sertani, etc. So the idea is that uh, he had also possessions in the county of Provence, who was even part of the Holy Roman Empire. We'll talk about this uh, later. Uh, in any case, this guy is called in, in the aforementioned Liber as Catalanicus Heroes, Rector Catalanicus, and Dux Catalanensis. Right? So the, um, the Catalania. Right, um, already uh, was uh, you know in, you know a literary term by the high Middle Ages. Uh, the etymology uh, is relatively disputed, but you know probably it we we got what what the meaning really is, which is also pretty simple. Um, it's basically Gothic loan, right? It's the idea of the land of the gods. Latin Gatia Launia, so it's basically the, the Latinization of a Germanic term, would be also called simply Gotia, right? Just like as we've seen this the same Septimania or Gautia, depending on the Latinization. Um, so this name stands from the, the the Germanic Gotland, right? That eventually was Latinized got, uh, in, the, in the local language. Uh, Gotalandia, Go Gotalania, and eventually Catalania, Catalonia. All right. Um, there are other uh, etymologies proposed, for example, by the Byzantine chroniclers, that thought Catalonia being a mix between the land of the gods and the islands, so the Gotalania, right? So Catalonia. Um, also, some point to the idea of. Um, uh, Catalan as Castellan, right? So the fact, as we've seen, that there were all these counties with um, local fortresses in a frontier area on the Pyrenees um, and pretty much everywhere it was normal for, for the high Middle Ages uh, after the process of encastellation. In any case, this um, name doesn't seem to be, a, you know, a, you know a mis much of a mystery. Um the, the term Catalonia was extended geographically also to uh, parts of the Languedoc, right? So again, this, that was also, um, but you could never quite tell where this land of the gods ended, right? So again, aside from the modern kind of more um, strictly provincial sense of Catalonia, uh, there was a broader Gotland that... Um, in fact, you can easily feel from just going to places like Carcassonne or Perpignan, etc., to, to be that close to, to the other side of the Pyrenees, and especially this region of the Ebro Valley. So, the Catalonian um, uh, power, led by the Counts of Barcelona, managed to 
consolidate an impressive domain across different uh, lands. Uh, the um, Count Ramon Berenger III incorporated, for example, the county of Bezalu near the Mediterranean coastline. Um, uh, also part of the county of Empurias, so another very important uh, coastal center, historically speaking, uh, Hellenic city, then Roman one, etc. All of the county of Sardania, mm -hmm. that was in fact one of the most important and expanding, thus also um, uh, in in the in the in the uplands, right, uh, the valley of the Upper Segre, specifically, and most impress impressively, the county of Provence, right, that. Um, we have uh, described in those videos about the count the uh, the the kingdom of Burgundy Arles as this southernmost Mediterranean um, area with Arles um, that was uh, incredibly strategic for for a number of reasons we'll explain now. This was, however, a feudal ac acquisition through um, Ramon Berenguer the Third's marriage to Dus of Provence that was the daughter of Gilbert I of uh, Gévaudan uh, and uh, Gerberga of Provence. Um, the Catalonians would maintain this foothold in, in Provence for, for a long time. First of all, because Barcelona was starting to develop, but at, at this time, in a relatively modest way, her naval power. Right, and they were they were essentially the most important uh, port in the area, also in, in southern France, practically. Um, so they uh, they could easily extend this coastal domination, at least over Germany. Right before, actually, the uh, we've seen it in in the videos about Genoa and Pisa, the, the Italian maritime republics would uh, simply uh, take over. Right, uh, and in fact, at this point, the same Catalonian influence is mostly a commercial one. Right, the Western Mediterranean is still dominated by the Italians, and it's only during the 13th century that the uh, the, the Catalonians will start, uh, you know, having their own consistent, also naval military power uh, in um, in the area. In any case, these feudal connections are more important because, uh, as you know, normally the, the Italian maritime republics did not venture in the interland. Um, while here the, the counts uh, of, of Barcelona are becoming essentially the leaders of a, um, of a continental power of some sort, of coastal areas, but still uh, with you know, important territorial extent. As we've seen, not so much in the interland, they're more interested in this coastal influence, but, but also, right, and they will keep progressing through these marriage ties and military operations and forming substantial boundaries with the county of Toulouse, right. At the same time, preserving their own autonomy further. Uh, for example, the Catalan church that up to this point had been independ uh, dependent of, of the bishopric of Narbonne restored uh, during the Reconquista the Archiepiscopal See of Tarragona in 1118, so uh, shifting essentially the center of their own church within their own land, right, and not uh, Narbonne uh, in, in the north that pertained instead to, um, to the Toulousans. Very mixed spheres of influence, no doubt, but it was important for a respectable, you know, uh, Christian prince at this point to have their own, you know, control on their, over their own church, as you know, with a territorial continuity overlap. In 1137, the dynastic union that um, uh, would later be known as the Crown of Aragon, about which I made a video, was established, quite importantly, for Catalonia. After uh, uh, Ramon 
Berenguer IV, uh, Count of Barcelona, had betrothed the heiress of the Kingdom of Aragon, Petronilla, that had been sedded in turn together with uh, the Aragonese Kingdom by the monarch Ramiro II, in fact, of Aragon, to the Count of Barcelona. Right. And this had been done by Ramiro II of Aragon, in part for, for dynastic reasons, by marrying his daughter to, to the Count of Barcelona, but also for political and strategic ones, because uh, Castile was pressuring um, Aragon, and by allying, uh, making this dynastic union, de facto, uh, with, um, with, uh, with Catalonia, the it would have been much more difficult for the Castilians to start that war, because the, the Aragonese and the Catalonians would have joined forces, and this, uh, as, as a deterrent, averted temporarily. At least there would be many wars between Aragons, uh, the, the, uh, Aragon and Castile. But, you know, at least at this point, it's how the, the Union began, right? We have seen what the crown of Aragon really was, and this is very, um, essentially a composite monarchy. Right, ruled by one king, but at the head of different chunks, right of uh, of power. That included um, uh, Catalonia and all the, for example, the Valencia, the all the dependencies, all these territories, as we've seen also in Provence, in uh, uh, eventually, as we will see now in the, uh, in the 13th century in in Italy, uh, etc. Uh, that, however, was very different from the kingdom of Castile and León, that was structuring itself as um, a essentially a feudal monarchy with a very heavy degree right of, of uh, monarchic imposition that however led admittedly to the establishment of the greatest uh, Iberian power right whereas the crown of Aragon would be afflicted by all a series of let's say internal uh, say division, or at least lack of a unitary uh, direction, because there were all different chunks at the time. Again, the fact that a single dynasty at the time would rule over these pieces didn't mean that, say, I don't know, the king of uh, the, the Aragonese king of Sicily was just particularly was following the same international policy of the one of Aragon uh, within the crown of Aragon, right? The kingdom of Aragon was just one, like here, like the uh, the the county of Barcelona, etc., like par under the crown of Aragon, which is a different thing. Th this is the uh, specific character, and surely Catalonia was the essentially the most would end up to be the most important center, with Barcelona as the capital, also of at least the the preferent uh, the preferred one of the Aragonese monarchs, um, uh, etc. Et uh, Ramon Berenguer the fourth. Uh, used the title, uh, at this point, Ramon had married, married Petronilla, right? so the heiress to the kingdom of, of Arg, and he used for himself the title of Comes Barchinonensis, uh, right? so the, the Count uh, of the Barcelonians, specifically, as his primary title. And Princeps Aragonensis, so Prince of the Aragonians as his second, right? And this was happening, uh, let's say, still uh, in a bit of a dual way, because he, from one side it was saying that Barcelona was more important than Aragon, but he was also doing so because his wife, as just uh, Queen Hayres after the death of her father, was bearing the title of Regina, proper, so of Queen. Um, and uh, there, it would be only their son and heir, Alfonso II, in fact, of Aragon and the first of Barcelona, to establish fully the dynastic union in his person as, in fact, Rex Aragonum, Comes Barchinone, at Marchio Province, right? So, King of Aragon, Count of Barcelona, and Marquis of Provence, right? The latter also, you see, figuring um, 
quite plainly. Again, the 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 Marquisate of Pro, uh, of Provence was not um, as important as the the Kingdom of Aragon or or the uh, County of uh, Barcelona individually. But again, as a as a as a very important position on on the Mediterranean, with controlling the delta of the Rhone, um, especially in these years where there is a lot of traffic really crossing from the from England, uh, Belgium, uh, the Flanders, uh, the Champagne fairs, uh, the the provincial ports, Tuscany, uh, Sicily, etc. It needs to make a lot of money. Right, and so you could even have this foreign merchants uh, shipping back and forth, but you were the guy who exacted the tolls locally, right? And it could afford to do that. It was not again a dramatically compacted, stable, or even reliable, as we will see now, um, dominion. But it was still impressive for the time, and it, this in, this uh, Catalonian influence uh, across all the region would um, be particularly felt culturally, politically, economically, um, uh, for a long time, right? Um, in, in the, within the crown of Aragon, Catalonia and Aragon retained their dis- distinct traditional rights, right? And Catalonia, uh, with her increasing um, maritime uh, interests and, and trade, etc., established what is effectively one of the first parliaments in European history, the Corts Catalanes, that is the Catalan courts, um, essentially the, the policy-making and parliamentary body of what was considered at this point the, still the Principality of, of Catalonia. Right. Uh, that reflected still, again, that plurality that we have um, spotted in this uh, originally composite nature of Catalonia herself with all these various counties and now with the interests of the rising estates, the 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 mercantile oligarchies, uh, the, as we've seen, the, the, the feudal power here. This is very important to stress, like while we look at um, the Aragonese through the Catalans um, being mostly this naval power, this kind of maritimely enterprising um, entity, Still bear in mind that this is not really like um, truly as a mercantile republic or something like that. The Catalan rulers are admittedly very feudally minded. They're basically uh, leaving some of the most uh, Frankish and chivalric um, influenced areas of the Iberian Peninsula. Consider they also have to compete as uh, with this sum of uh, dynastic possessions as kings of Aragon. Um, with with Castile, which surely uh, does boast all this kind of um, monarchic greatness, and so uh, Catalonia at a point has to do uh, a bit the same, right? But it's uh, a resourceful uh, and composite and uh, mixed uh, system uh, with pros and cons, as we will see now. Uh, Ramon Berenguer de Fort that, as we've seen, uh, controlled Aragon, Catalonia, and Provence, also uh, um, conquered during the Reconquista the aforementioned Islamic uh, Catalonian cities of Leida and Tortosa, completing thus the unification of all what is today's Catalonia, right? Uh, And it was there to, to stay. The Reconquista process in this lens naturally happened pretty much like in, in other contexts. Catalonia had already not been alien to, for example, uh, population transfers, deportations, etc., especially to repopulate the uh, the newly conquered centers where a consistent part of the inhabitants would have fled from and or would have been killed in all or know, just would have perished in other ways um, during these uh, very intense attritional uh, clashes, very methodic ones, a lot of siege warfare raids. I, again, made multiple videos on but even the, the dictionary of the Reconquista to distinguish the various types of expeditions um, and so on. Uh, thus, um, there was, again, many, uh, many directions, many different tools. 
tools that uh, were employed were any different. Uh, also sources of income. The, the parias, the system of fixed uh, uh, precious metal uh, tributes exacted from, uh, from those uh, Islamic communities that, that the Christian rulers were started to, to hegemonize, protect, even from other Muslims or even from other Christians, as we've seen, as these Christian powers were competing with one another, not less ferociously than with the, the Muslims, uh, at some point... Here with trade, with um, feudal rents, with with other, with other con with loot again, with piracy, as well, uh, et etc. Um, all this political compaction brought um, uh, the time of, of uh, the ruler Alfonso uh, in 1173. Um, to regard Catalonia as properly a polity on its own, right? So, the concept of the the original uh, mark and you know the the pre-existing political destructuation had been de facto surpassed as a greater entity, right? Uh, this was also the time in which the usages of Barcelona were kept being uh, compiled. Even after uh, a century, they had been been around, uh, and th this would become known as the Consuetudinum Catalonia, right? So the again, you have this. Th this is how medieval law works. We've seen it many times. It's essentially common law um, with some here and there a pinch of civil law. If I mean, in some cases, that um, cumulates, right? There are some customary. Uh, agreements that are that enter in the in the theory and in uh, practice of uh, of jurisprudence. Apart from the usages, we find between uh, 1170 and 1195 some of the most important um, literary works uh, in the um, in Catalonian uh, history. And that would build essentially the, the political identity of the country. One is the Liber Feudorum Maier, that is still a, um, uh, a juridical text uh, in nature, containing more than 900 cent documents, mostly charters, right, dating back um, as far as the 10th century. So th it's a jurisprudential collection of um, legally valid uh, uh, material that the jurist could in fact uh, uh, get back on to uh, verify certain specific rights of the, of the rulers, kind of developing even a new type of of policy or you know uh, or laws. Um, and it's also uh, a very precious historical source, as you understand, because it tells us uh, how also the land had been governed um, in those um, last uh, couple of centuries. And the other work is instead a uh, Latin chronicle uh, known as the Gesta Comitum Barcinonensium et Regum Aragonia that uh, essentially presents uh, the, uh, the rulers of the county of Barcelona as the descendants of Charlemagne, right, justifying their independent policy from the Western Frankish kingdom, uh, to whom technically they, they would still belong. In fact, as we will see now in, in the following centuries, problems with France, as I hinted at before, will arise. Uh, and uh, expressing already what, what was the, the political awareness of Catalonia as a, as a country um, on its own. Um, a country that was becoming the center of the same Aragonese crown, given the... Uh, the rising sea power of Barcelona, right? This city became to, to dominate um, a substantial maritime uh, dominion extending over several lands of the, uh, actually of the entire Mediterranean, because as we will see at least some, uh, even some possessions in Greece were some proxies of the, of the crown of Aragon. And again, I made a video about the uh, the Almogavares, the uh, 
the, the company or Roger de Flor, the Catalan company, etc. We will keep talking uh, about those. Right, so today I will not talk about the history of um, all the, the possessions that in this sense stemmed from the, uh, the Catalan expansion. Uh, that, as we've seen, was also backed by, by other uh, forces uh, in the process. Uh, I already made a video about the Kingdom of, Bal uh, of Valencia. We will have to talk about the Balearic Islands that at this point had been fundamentally uh, stripped from the, from the Saracens. Sardinia, too, that was uh, essentially uh, taken away from the, the peasants. The Genoese admittedly kept infesting the north of the island so that it was never like a fully like a full conquest right the the the, the crown of Aragon claimed as we were saying before even the the control of um, the kingship of Corsica but as a matter of fact that always remained uh, Genoese in full control uh, but famously enough like during the Vespers uh, the, uh, the 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 Aragonese intervened in Sicily uh, stripping it from from the Angevins uh, and starting a you know the, that kind of competition for for southern Italy that in the 15th century would bring the Ara the Aragonese king also on the throne of Naples and thus um, securing an important uh, land mass in 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 the south of uh, of the Apennine Peninsula. So these are all things I discussed in, in other videos. I did make also a, a video on uh, Aragonese Sicily that explains a bit how the thing worked there. So again, I will still have to make the, the Aragonese uh, Naples one, but that, that's an idea for further uh, videos, in fact. Uh, what today we, we discuss rather is how this impacted Catalog. Right, so this especially large increase of maritime trade uh, uh, witnessed a, a bit by the, all the Catalan ports naturally but that at, at this point is mostly uh, you know evident in the let's say the Aragonese crown's leading city Barcelona that uh, rose to prominence over basically any other um, city of these possessions as far as a, as a port um, and as, as a naval power. Um, admittedly, this, uh, say, Catalan naval power was not as, let's say, politically or militarily concentrated like you see in the cases of Venice or also the, um, the Genoese uh, rivals of, of Aragon. In fact, we will signed with, with the, the Venetians and uh, obliged the, the Genoese to take the Atlantic route, uh, also signing with Castilla in the process, uh, arriving up to, to England. Um, but controlling, again, this impressive amount of territories in, in the Mediterranean, the, the county of Provence, the lordship of Montpellier, the kingdom of Mallorca, the kingdom of Valencia, again, the, naturally the Catalonian and Aragonese, mainland, then the, the Kingdom of Sardinia, the Kingdom of Sicily, the Kingdom of Naples, the, the Duchy of Neopatris, the Duchy of Athens, and at points even more, could essentially um, rendered available to the entire crown of Aragon uh, substantial naval power capable of competing with, with the Genoese. Right? Um, Barcelona also became, um, in fact, very entangled with, with Italian uh, trade and culture, some of the most important cartographers of the 14th, of, of even the 30, from the 13th, um, uh, fifth, the, the 15th century, were, were Catalan. Uh, there was uh, an intense, um, probably cultural exchange, you know, the, the history later on of Colombo. People living a, a bit in between this sea world, we could say. Um, made by constant um, intersections uh, at the end of the day. Uh, in spite of the rivalries, at some point, say, I don't know, the Genoese merchants were allowed in Barcelona, and when war broke out, uh, the, the, their goods were confiscated, they were imprisoned, and, you know, after the war was over, they were reinstated. All of this back and forth that happened all the time. Um, we will talk about this in, in other videos, but the, the Aragonese really had 
um, a very vast um, uh, an extended net of spies that literally were present, for example, in every single Italian uh, city-state, uh, listening to the uh, king every single, again, who was the most powerful person in the city, of whom they could count, generally speaking, as we will see now by signing against uh, France and the Angevins, uh, the Aragonese were Ghibellines, right? So they were interested in that party. And not always, again, uh, as I said before, the fact that the, the powers of, of the crown were all a bit autonomous on their own, sometimes brought them to sign with the with whomever, even with the, with the Pope at some point. Um, this is a bit too complex to digress on. This tells you, especially through the establishment, as we will see now, of an important archivistic capacity from a substantially centralized power of an enormous amount of documents. Think uh, um, collected the uh, famous Acta Aragonensia that you can find even on archive.org. It's one of the sources that I use very often for my military historical studies. Um, that are um, an extraordinary collection of sources, all preserved from those times, letters written again from here, from Genoa, from Florence, whatever, um, uh, to, to, the, to the king. Right, literally telling them about this battle, this ruler, what was I don't know, what were the French doing, what was the emperor doing, etc. Right. Um, so did this this growth in power, as we were saying before, pose um, uh, Catalonia in contrast with um, with other polities, to to say the least. At the end of the twelfth century. Uh, there were, first of all, some wars and eventual settlements between the crowns of Aragon and the one of Castile, right? These were um, uh, the designed also before the great victory of Las Navas and the, the fact of the opening to the rich... Uh, southern lands of Andalusia to the Christians, like the areas, let's say, of, of repartition of these various powers. Um, and uh, Castille was interested in gaining uh, like an opening on, on the Mediterranean proper. The uh, Catalonians were more interested naturally in preserving as much Mediterranean coastland as, as they could, because they could simply um, really, th this had some repercussions even with uh, on the level of, for example, the rules with the Nasrids, with other this uh, Islamic uh, rulers that after Las Navas technically were just um, f uh, vassals of the Christian rulers that had always styled themselves as the protectors of the Jews, of the Muslims, and of the Christians uh, during the Reconquista. Um, and um, uh, we will see this better at another point. Uh, that was um, a specific concern. As we've seen, the, the, the conquest of the King of Valencia was very gradual. It went at kind of step by step. Um, there were, admittedly, the, the centralized areas, even for, for the same Iberian, this main Iberian powers that led, as we've seen, mostly from, from the north. Uh, at best, the Castilians would start ruling from Toledo, right? A bit substituting themselves to that continental Visigothic power against this Ebro Valley, uh, more more Romanized Ebro Valley we've seen closer to Occitania, etc. And it, it's also, in fact, the um, the uh, the relation with Occitania is worth mentioning because the Catalonians supported specifically the uh, county of Toulouse uh, against the crusaders of Simon de Montfort, right? So this attempt of, of the French to essentially seize control uh, of the county of Toulouse, affirming themselves once for all uh, in, in southern France, recovering those territories that, as we've seen, it did include historically the same Catalonia on, on the other side of, of the Pyrenees. Famously enough, Peter II of Aragon uh, was killed um, by Simon de Montfort in 1213 at the Battle of Muret. This is one of the most uh, 
kind of important clashes, especially as far as the flank attack tactics in in Western warfare was beginning to be affirmed on a larger scale. That uh, proved also a bit like the superiority of French warfare um, and the most um, you know uh, competent tactical innovations uh, carryable uh, by out by the by this by such uh, shrewd leaders like Simone de Montfort, etc. Um, the, the Provencal connection remained a bit more because um, this land was, um, was part of the Holy Roman Empire. In any case, the Angevins, as you know, would seize the county of Provence, and from there they also established themselves as a major Mediterranean power by seizing the Kingdom of Sicily altogether. James the first of Aragon, that was uh, the successor of Peter the um, second, um, had to struggle for consolidating his power. Um, that was, however, achieved in 1227. Uh, under this sovereign's rule, uh, the Catalonians conquered uh, an important amount of, of territories, such as the, uh, the the island of Majorca and the aforementioned kingdom of Valencia by seizing properly the uh, the capital, right? Again, Aragonese Catalans uh, at the same time. Uh, Valencia became a new state, properly a kingdom, the third one associated with the crown of Aragon. So provided, as we've seen, with a new foro, that is to say, a code of laws. Foro is a term that comes from the Latin Forum, so this kind of council, essentially, that uh, this parliament that had uh, become, in uh, in the meanwhile, the Force de Valencia. The Mallorcan territory and the counties of Cerdania, Vallespir, Capsir, and Roussillon, and the city of Montpellier were left, however, dynastically um, as, um, as a kingdom to um, James uh, the first son, James the second, that in fact would be known as James of Mallorca because this kingdom took the name of uh, Mallorca right, controlling again also not just the, the Balearic um, archipelago but also the uh, parts of the um, European continent. This division reflected naturally the, uh, but of course the feudal practice at, at the time, but uh, you know if, if it had been possible keeping things together th they would have succeeded in doing so. Again the heterogeneity mostly of these lands and th the preoccupations that the local communities have in maintaining their own autonomy. Because uh, the crown of Aragon had been established, as we've seen a bit with this incredibly touchy, you know, um, uh, if not paranoid character of the Catalonians maintaining their own autonomy at all costs. Um, but the, the, the truth was that Barcelona was rising to uh, a very great amount of power and that the other subjects of the Aragonese crown were starting to, you know, to protest partially and or to search to bit of to escape centrifugally um, from uh, from this push, right? In fact, such division began in the early 13th century of the two areas of the crown would remain separated until the uh, later reannexation, essentially, to the same crown of Aragon of the Kingdom of Mallorca in 1344 by Peter IV known as the Ceremonies, there is also a famous chronicle uh, of his. However, these divisions prompted, especially after the final um, absorption of uh, southern France by, by, by the, the Capetians, uh, the, a French intervention against uh, the Aragonese. In 1258, James I uh, and uh, Louis IX of France signed the Treaty of Corbeil. At this point, essentially, the French renounced um, as heirs of Chardonnay, 
recognized by by the same Aragonese to the claims of feudal overlordship over Catalonia, right? That, as we've seen, had been uh, independent from French rule since, uh, you know, formally the say the, the end of the 10th century, given there hadn't been many more contacts anymore, but practically even before, right, from already the end of the night. In exchange, um, James uh, renounced, uh, James I renounced uh, his claims in Occitania, in turn. So basically they established the Pyrenees as the, you know, the, the historical boundary between the two countries. Uh, there would be actually some uh, French coming back. Philip III of France would try to reinvade Catalonia, but he died famously after a battle for the wounds suffered in it. Um, and the, his successor, Philip IV, basically bailed out of, uh, of that mess entirely and decided to concentrate uh, the French efforts rather from the completely opposite geographical direction uh, of the north uh, of the northeast against the county of Flanders that we we um, we, we have seen in our dedicated videos. Um, this, uh, of course, was part of the bigger struggle as we've seen in the Mediterranean. The the fact that um, the as we will see now that the, the Aragonese had would be expanding at, at the detriment of the Angevins that were still peers of the, the French kingdom uh, and the general contrast that could exist between um, again a, a major landmass and by that point the greatest power in Europe that uh, that was France that however was based uh, as you know the the, the power in the north and this more kind of uh, say softer power that could in, in, infiltrate um, in the same southern France uh, through trade, through some kind of other influences and being simply closer to it. It's always creating a sort of problem, especially as far as the control of the uh, say of the southern coasts that were the ones that the French kings counted on for um, the, the just the their Mediterranean policy, right? So these are also very complex relations. We we don't have the time to analyze today, but we will see, hopefully, in, in another video. Catalonia was profiling uh, itself as an ever more uh, institutionally based um, political system, right? Uh, the estates of the realm uh, were represented uh, ever more consistently uh, to the sovereign uh, from uh, 1283 onwards, especially legislation uh, in the country had to be approved in the uh, Catalan courts, known also as the General Court of Catalonia, uh, that um, uh, was, as we've seen, regarded as essentially one of the earliest parliamentary bodies in, in Europe, and in this case capable essentially um, for the first time of banning the royal power to um, unilaterally create uh, a legislation. That is to say, um, not just medieval kings couldn't practically um, emanate laws uh, just uh, to, to be affirmed over the rights of other of, of the communities that they were called again to to protect their, the pre-existing rights of. But in this case, that he could not step in properly without the consent of the parliament. That tells you how, after all, how limited, in fact, the power of the Aragonese one was in certain spheres, at least, of local uh, administration. Then, of course, all these various chunks of the crown would cooperate to kind of uh, concentrate forces, put resources in common for the, the overseas policies. It's, again, but it was very complicated and as we will see now, even the the continental um, domains weren't so stable uh, as you would expect any anyhow for from any medieval power 
in some way. Now, the Catalan courts were composed essentially of three estates, um, presided over by the king, that, remember, this is the Catalonian courts, um, that act as Count of Barcelona, right? So not in the best of, uh, even as a superior overlord, right? But just for the, um, uh, for the sake of the internal policy, uh, approving the constitutions that, um, as we've seen, created over time this um, juridical tradition, compiling uh, the rights of the of, of the community of the Catalonian principality. Uh, and in order to collect general taxes that were needed anyway for, for government, the uh, Catalan courts of 1359 established a permanent representation of deputies, the uh, Diputació del General, so the, the general's deputation, that is also known later as Generalitat, uh, which w was destined to gain importance over time because um, it essentially defined who were the, uh, in fact, the, the 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 communities that would be represented by the fact an alienable right by constitution at these parliaments, so that you couldn't quite just summon uh, the the parliament by prohibiting somebody to from participating right and uh, to participate and um, uh, su substantially be, be being dependent on these figures that had their own you know uh, business interests local power prestige could not simply be dislodged Catalonia had a quite prosperous moment of growth during especially the 13th century. That's really the peak growth uh, together with the great medieval civilization. Also the first half of the 14th uh, was uh, important. There were new lands overseas that were brought under the Catalan control. Um, uh, the, the Catalans were properly uh, becoming a, a broader western Mediterranean culture, right? Just not a uh, one of the, as we've seen, of the, uh, you know, of the provinces of the Mediterranean coastland, but as a major power, fundamentally, it could exert its control on a wide amount of, of territories. The reign of Peter the Third of Aragon included the conquest of Sicily during the um, Vespers, as we've seen the aforementioned defense against what had been a French crusade by. Um, Philip uh, the Third of, of, of France that died in the enterprise. Uh, Peter's son Alfonso the uh, Third conquered uh, Menorca. Uh, that uh, you know was united essentially was was annexed to the to the kingdom of Majorca. Naturally, there had already been a previous Catalan influence on these uh, islands, but conquering, occupying them direct was, was a big deal. Uh, and uh, a deal that was celebrated properly as a feudal achievement, because these lands, as, you know, because, just because of the Reconquista in general, were felt to, to, to become, of course, the, the right, uh, you know, the, the ones that these rulers would have to eventually maintained by right, having been conquered in the name of God, uh, and etc. Um, Peter's second son, James II, uh, was the, um, the first one who uh, acceded to the throne of Sicily, uh, and then succeeded his older brother as king of Aragon at the same time conquered also Sardinia after the battle of Lugocisterna, uh, crushing the Pisans and the Germans uh, and uh, effectively taking uh, Cagliari and establishing at least control in the most important part of, of the island with, again, problems of the interland, the, 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 the interland 
the Sardinian internet was, was a nightmare to say the least. Uh, plus there was also this continuous Genoese, uh, you know, uh, infestation. Uh, that was uh, an important shot because it was not planned, even just in the broader scheme of things. Um, and great, cook, let's say, that helped bridging the distance as a power base between uh, Sicily and uh, and Spain, uh, as up to that point it had been under uh, the Pisan control. Under James II, especially uh, Barcelona was uh, consolidated as the administrative center of the domains. The royal archives uh, that we mentioned before is, you know, providing this important amount of documents on the institutions, but just on the history of, of, of the country and also of the others with which uh, Catalonia was in contact um, in uh, establishing again in 1318. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the moment of greatest splendor, let's say, of, of Barcelona, let's say, of Catalan power in relative terms to the to the other elements of, of the Aragonese uh, crown. These are also the years in which the Grand Catalan Company, led by the adventurer Roger de Flor, uh, together with his mercenaries, formed by again uh, Almogavar veterans of the War of the West of the Vespers between Sicily and Naples were hired uh, by the Byzantine Empire to fight uh, the, the Turks in Anatolia and crushing them in several battles after the assassination of Roger de Flor by the Emperor's son Michael Palaiologos in 1305 and the Catalans basically mutinied and um, they began to sack the Byzantine interland Thrace um, and ended up in Greece, which they took control of the aforementioned duchies of Athens and Neopatris, that they held, namely, uh, on behalf of the King of Aragon, that considered that they considered uh, considered to be their lord, naturally. So there is this sense of national attachment and feudal um, recognition. Uh, Catalan mercenaries were used widely at this point in the Mediterranean. They became uh, albeit um, they had been fighting, as we've seen, against the Angevins after the War of the Vespers, they were hired by the same Naples that sent it as garrisons in the various uh, Guelph centers of central and northern Italy, to be, however, basically supplanted entirely after uh, a few, you know, one decade essentially, by German and French uh, heavies, uh, heavy cavalry, men at arms. The Catalan, the the, the Almo Gavars were notoriously um, kind of infantry. They they had heavy cavalry as well, but mostly they were foot soldiers, not even so light. Right? They crushed the the cavalry of the Duke of Athens in uh, the Bren in Greece, um, but they uh, that, that's basically all they were. Right? Foot troops, very hungry and you know, kind of angry in many ways, but probably not really the future of warfare, if not as kind of lighter uh, troops later on, mostly specializing, coming from, in fact, places like Aragon, Navarre, this, especially the mountainous interland, right, of of the uh, Crown of Aragon's possessions. Um, the rule of uh, Greece by uh, the Catalans lasted in in the in this um, ascent, uh, in fact Greek cities until uh, the uh, the 90s of the 14th century, and it was important because it somehow prepared a bit the relations of um, the Crown of Aragon uh, as they would settle in uh, in Naples during the the 15th century with the um, rising Albanian principalities of the Balkans, especially the Treaty of Gaeta would, uh, in 1451 would um, be signed between um, Alfonso V uh, of Naples and the ambassadors of Skanderbeg. 
Um, and uh, that era was quite important, if anything, because the Ottomans were rising in power. At that point, the, the Aragonese were just uh, there in the Mediterranean to, to cope with that. And the Albanian resistance was, was important, having established these relations uh, boards through it. Um, so all of this uh, entailed uh, a dramatic expansion of cattle and trade, if anything, from a geographical point of view. And most of this would uh, essentially um, bring to uh, the enrichment, the further enrichment of Barcelona. As we've seen, there was a competition with the Italian maritime republics, especially Genoa, also with Venice, right? They were all competing with one another, but chiefly the, the main rivals of the Catalans were the Genoese, because they're basically from in the same western uh, Mediterranean. And this brought the necessity of disciplining further the uh, diplomatic relations um, the consulate of the sea was established in the crown of Aragon uh, at this time also the book of the consulate of the sea uh, as a compendium of maritime law governing trade uh, in the Mediterranean uh, you know was uh, uh, issued at this point so these were very important steps in the uh, building of maritime law historically um, and uh, it was all intertwined with the spread of banking, right? Uh, especially uh, the uh, Barcelonian authorities established in 1401 uh, a public bank, right? Uh, the known as the Taula de Cambi, uh, that uh, could be seen in, in, in some ways at least a, a first, uh, if not the first, at least one of the first central banks uh, in history because they basically represented the same public authority. They weren't just privates, um, of course connected with public authority but not being quite the same. Here instead they were starting to become all one with it, a bit like de facto, the, the Genoese with the Bank of St. George, um, uh, etc. Interestingly enough, uh, it would be the, the Genoese banks that, as you know, would finance after the bankruptcy of the Fugger in the 16th century, the Spanish Empire later on. So, at least um, th this tells you by scale how you know still um, a city like Barcelona was substantially different from one like Genoa or, or Venice, really, uh, in many ways. In the way, it's just again it was part of a broader feudal state right uh, rather than being uh, a city state and like in the case especially venice uh, being really a superpower on her own right this was something on say slightly slightly different um the mid 14th century crisis the the crisis of the great medieval civilization struck a uh, catalan economy just like basically any other uh, at the time. 1333 is remembered in the Catalan accounts as Lo Mal Ani Primer, that is the, the first bad year, literally, because there was a, a pretty harsh famine striking the lands um, of Catalonia. Um, it's estimated that from the mid 14th century, from, from the Black Death essentially, to the threshold of the modern age, Catalonia lost something like 40% of its, of its inhabitants, which is really a lot, right? And, uh, you know, you can have re uh, a lot of surplus banks and so on, but these are pre-industrial systems, and the loss of such amount of population is really, really heavy, right? Um, plus, um, Wars were not really stopping, right? As successful as the Aragonese had been in the Mediterranean, uh, there were continuous uh, rebellions in their possessions. Um, the same annexation of, Mayo uh, of Mallorca had been substantially costly in the time of Peter the Ceremonious. As we've seen, this had been a separated kingdom that had started developing kind of the same cat. Catalan mentality of autonomy and was crushed by the same by, by the crown of Aragon in that sense or at least you know 
brought to obedience once again. Um, there were substantial rebellions in Sardinia, and even in, within the same Aragon, right? Uh, because uh, this land that was more Aragon is a continental country, like it's a place with you know cattle, mountains. It's a feudal land, right? Catalonia is different, and the latter was. Um, in fact, considerably richer, and had began to acquire privileges, if you want, over the same poor Aragon, right? So the fact that the crown, because, you know, Aragon was a kingdom, and so the, the name of the crown of Aragon remained as such, uh, doesn't mean that Catalonia was effectively more powerful. Um, and in this sense, the Aragonese, however, also because of the crisis of Catalonia, etc., exploited um, the, uh, the, the the situation to um, to rebel and to um, essentially conf confer to to to, to Aragon a um, and to this partly was naturally an effort joined by the other lands in favor say against the the interference of the of you know, the Catalan power to, to centralize more the, cr the crown, and so especially for Aragon to acquire more prerogatives on their own in the system. Uh, there was also an Aragonese-Castilian war, was quite costly, so again, quite burdensome set of uh, struggles. Uh, this, the financial situation was quite delicate, especially now that again there was a demographic and economic crisis uh, going on. And it was n not over, because Cherry on Top, uh, as we've seen in 1410, the original um, Catalonian dynasty extinguishes with uh, the death of Martin I without a descendant or even a named successor, which would have been something at least. So there was an, in, uh, an interregnum, lasting only two years, really, but that brought at this point, the um, Castilian Trastamara dynasty uh, in, uh, in, in the person of Ferdinand of Antequera to be the, um, at least uh, temporarily the regent, right, uh, at least candidate to the throne. Uh, with the compromise of Caspe in 1412, um, uh, in front of the uh, dignitaries of Aragon, Valencia and Catalonia, so the main Iberian uh, powers of the crown, uh, uh, Ferdinand was elected as uh, the first, Ferdinand the first of, of Aragon, thus uh, establishing this, um, this, this new uh, bloodline. In all this, there had been an opposition, naturally, in the person of the of James II, Count of Urgell, that had been defeated in 1413 as a candidate for, for the throne. Um, the Trastamara dynasty was, uh, you know, led at least uh, Catalonia to a more solid uh, direction, right? Alfonso V was uh, Ferdinand's successor and one of the, known as the magnanimous, one of the greatest kings uh, of, of Aragon. He uh, essentially tried, twice, but finally succeeding, to conquer the kingdom of Naples after having first been crushed um, and uh, Caught prisoner by the Angevins who sent him uh, to to Milan, uh, finally convincing the local duke that a an Aragonese Naples would be more advantageous in his policy. I made a video specifically uh, on this. If you go in the medieval Italy playlist, you you will find it. Um, so much so that in 1443, also backed by Milan, Alfonso managed to seize Naples and her rich, uh, you know, interland. 
Admittedly, uh, since the time of the Vespers, also in Sicily, it had been very difficult to rule in southern Italy for uh, even in, for the Angevins at the times of the crusade against Manfred, because the power of the barons uh, had increased dramatically, and so there was a sort of brokered rule. This these lands, as you know, would become vice uh, royam in uh, in the institutional system of the uh, of the in fact of the kingdom of Aragon, because uh, really even the so-called unification of uh, Aragon and, and Castilla at the end of the 15th century wasn't really the unification of a of a Spanish state. Right, this would occur only in the 18th century. This this two chunks remain separated, right? But the problem was that the barons were essentially eroding public authority and it was always a, uh, too many wars of conquest had shattered the uh, balance that the Normans and the Swabians had tried to keep Reno um, standing. Um, this conquest, because Naples was really was much more important than Sicily at that point, um, and it became, in fact, the one of the most favorite residences. And and the addition of yet another major, the, the largest actually landmass, um, to the crown of Aragon brought to a decline of the principality of Catalonia. Right, this was being aggravated, in a sense, by the feudal, the partial feudalization of the system. And a social crisis that struck both people in the countryside and in the cities. In fact, a conflict um, um, arose in Barcelona uh, between two um, political factions within the um, Council of the One Hundred, uh, that were known as Big and Busca. Uh, that had different ideas on how to fix the economic crisis. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, the peasantry was getting uh, pretty dissatisfied with all this instability, uh, and they began to associate themselves uh, and openly rebel against uh, the nobility pressure. Uh, successfully so, because they at least uh, searched for the protection of the monarch, right? So and the monarch wanted to curb the nobility, to, to have a stronger power, more centralized one. Um, this movement would be uh, known as, the, take the name of the same mode of serfdom existing in, in, in Catalonia, that is uh, the remensa, right? Uh, and uh, because they, they, these people lived in quite precarious conditions in the first place again uh, before for the high middle ages we talked about the yellow airs and so on but over time these weren't areas provided with particular amount of per capita wealth let's say uh, and they uh, you know that they, they especially in the countryside these were mostly feudal realities right very different from from the city from the coastal cities that were also relatively oblivious of uh, what was ha was happening in the interland. They were all about uh, the sea, right? A bit like the the Italian city state, at least the maritime city state. Um, so uh, there was all a series of um, strifes, right? This this can be framed. I mean, think about the who sides. Think about what Tyler, John Bull, we were the same, a bit in the same years, right? There were wars. Um, for example, uh, Alfonso V's uh, brother, John II, um, that would uh, essentially be a regent and a ruler at the same time in the Basque Kingdom of Navarre, as much as in Catalonia, was deeply despised and uh, hated and uh, caused uh, re trigger revolts um, and so on. The Catalan rebellions to John II prompted, also for uh, uh, usurped dynastic rights, the intervention um, of uh, Charles, Prince of uh, Viana, 
uh, that was uh, the same son of John um, and this was um, uh, you know again again a quite open conflict in which Charles was uh, even imprisoned by uh, his father and at that point the um, general Itat um, established uh, uh, another body uh, in the in the in the Barcelonian institution that was the council of the principality um, that pushed uh, politically and militarily John to uh, negotiate in fact at the capitulation of Villa Franca in 1461 uh, Ch um, John was obliged to re release uh, his son Charles from prison and to appoint him lieutenant of Catalonia right and this uh, also uh, in entailed the, uh, the the power of the Generalitat over the uh, the right of the same king to enter the principality physically. So this tells you again the extent of autonomy that uh, Catalonia had uh, achieved even amidst this kind of more critical uh, centuries. Uh, naturally that was a pretty specifically determined uh, political situation. John had been somehow awful uh, in any case, this would be the peak of Catalonian uh, pactism and, um, let's say, again, autonomy, broadly speaking, from an institutional uh, point of view. Right. Uh, there was a servile uprising in 1462 that triggered uh, uh, a 10 year Catalan civil war even consider that in uh, the same the same 1461 uh, uh, Charles had uh, died right so all that uh, litigation for really uh, not much at least it was um, a Catalan victory in extremis but again these are the biological chances let's say that brought this uh, ruler to the lieutenant to to pass away and this 10-year Catalan civil war was um, incredibly um, uh, devastating for the country it was still fought essentially against John the second right uh, and in 1472 uh, uh, the uh, country was so exhausted that um, uh, the the the, the Catalonian uh, authorities uh, fundamentally uh, uh, brought to uh, were 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 brought to capitulate right at Pedralbes. So this was a royal victory of John the Second. There had been a another ruler Rene of Anjou that had been called into Catalonia against uh, John, but. Uh, the um, the the country, uh, after all, had uh, the, the, uh, lost his uh, uh, his capacity to to make leverage uh, on the rule. Did not uh, arrive to to any substantial conclusion. In any case, uh, the situation settled uh, a bit. In 1493, France uh, rendered back to Catalonia the counties of Roussillon and Cerdagne. Sardinia, that um, they had uh, occupied during the Catalonian turmoil. Right uh, at this point, Ferdinand II of Aragon, Ferdinand the, the Catholic, right, you know, the uh, husband of Queen Isabella the First of, of Castile, um, essentially reformed deeply uh, the Catalan political system. Right. Um, first of all, he managed to reassert his control on the uh, northern frontier uh, of the Catalan counties without um, without war, which was uh, a big deal. He um, was 
an active sovereign uh, also in Italy and was able to um, essentially solve part of the problem with the romances through the Sentencia Arbitral de, de Guadalupe right? um, that essentially issued the um, Romanza peasants to be freed in exchange for some fees. Fundamentally, uh, the thing was settled actually also with a, an important degree of brutality because still some of these peasants were in arms and they were put down anyway, right? So it was just a negotiated um, settlement also with the nobility and etc. However, on the longer run, the sentencia allowed um, uh, essentially the new uh, infiteutic agreement, so this kind of long-term land uh, exploitation contracts to be freely contracted, right, uh, uh, by right, right, so you couldn't quite be forced into these um, relations, right, and this provided Catalonia with an important degree of, you know, at least of social, uh, you know, balance in, in the following centuries. And there would be further revolts historically uh, in those areas, but uh, we're talking about mostly 17th century. We do not talk about this uh, today. Um, and uh, in general, Ferdinand, uh, say, maintained control in the area by establishing the Constitucio de l'Observanza, that is to say, um, uh, a law uh, establishing the submission of royal power to the laws, right, at least by degree. In 1481, together with the Catalan courts, right, um, this applied to the Principality of Catalonia, and uh, it, um, it was essentially reaffirming, even though the, the social balance had substantially changed in favor of the, of the elites, still the prerogatives of these elites, the, um, the founded on, you know, a, a cooperation with the monarchy fundamentally, and so uh, uh, something, the relations of which went, uh, you know, beyond, uh, at this point, the same Middle Ages, these were the same years in which America was being uh, colonized, uh, and uh, and so it, it's really another page. But uh, let's say this is perhaps uh, you know too concise introduction to the history of medieval Catalonia. I was glad to make it for today. However, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoy it this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content uh, as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye